Grant. Okay. I got it. <laughs> uh, Grant is the Senior Manager of Collections and Exhibitions at the Bytown Museum. The HSO is fortunate to have had such a long collaborative relationship with the Bytown Museum. Back in 1917, the Women's Canadian Historical Society of Ottawa took a small collection of artifacts owned by the ladies of the society and put them on display at the Ottawa City Registry Building on Nicholas Street, which they called the Bytown Museum. The museum moved in 1952 to its current location at the Commissariat Building on the west side of the Rideau Canal at the Flight Locks. And Grant tonight is going to give us a sneak peek of the intriguing stories that lie behind some of the rare paintings that he's going to talk about because in addition to artifacts, the Bytown Museum also has a wonderful collection of paintings. And so with that in mind, I will uh, ask you to please welcome our guest speaker for the evening, Grant Vogel. Thank you everyone. Uh, just give me a second here and I will get my screen up. Can everyone um, see the slideshow? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks to the HSO for uh, inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, the focus of the talk, of course, is our new special exhibition, A Local Canvas, Paintings from the Bytown Museum Collection. And um, while we haven't been open for the last couple of years, we're really excited to kind of give you a sneak peek of what you can expect to see um, when, when you can come back to the museum. So just a, a brief overview of the talk tonight. So um, Richard gave a little bit of detail, but I will give a, a bit more of an introduction to uh, the museum itself. And then I'll give it also an introduction to a local canvas, kind of the reasoning behind the exhibition happening and what to expect. Um, Following that, I will give uh, a bit of a preview of our virtual tour of the exhibition, just to set uh, the scene and, and let you see what the space um, looks like and what to expect when you're, when you're at the museum, but also how you can access the exhibition before we open. And then I'm gonna move on. I've, I've selected a, a, a series of works from the exhibit itself to go into a bit more detail about what you can expect to see. Um, and each uh, painting from the exhibition, I've also paired with another uh, piece or a couple of pieces from our collection to kind of expand upon uh, the stories that, that that painting is telling and just to kind of give a bit more context to what you're looking at. Um, also because we have been closed for the last couple of years and I'm sure people are excited to see um, what we've got coming up. I am going to just touch on some of our upcoming events, uh, a little bit of our reopening schedule and, uh, and that kind of thing just to, to uh, give you as much detail about our our future plans as we can give at this time. And then uh, obviously time for, for questions at the end. So again, uh, I'm Grant Vogel. I'm the Senior Manager of Collections and Exhibitions at the Bytown Museum. I've been with the museum for just over 12 years now. And um, in that time, I've curated all of the museum's exhibitions uh, that en encompasses research and writing and, and design. Um, installation. We're, we're a small staff and so we all we all wear many hats and like we say all of our contracts in, include a line that says other duties as assigned um, but quite frankly we all like it that way. We like to kind of have our hands into all of different activities that the museum has on offer and um, it's just really a fantastic a fantastic opportunity to share Ottawa's history. So um, the Bytown Museum collection began in June of 1898 with the founding of the Women's Canadian Historical Society of Ottawa. The Historical Society had the motto of love thou thy land and their goal was to quote, encourage the collection and preservation of Canadian historical records and relics and to foster Canadian loyalty and patriotism. Uh, now they did a couple of loan exhibitions and some publications but uh, collecting uh, didn't really occur at that time uh, because there was no permanent home um, for the museum. However, in 1917, uh, the Bytown Historical Museum was founded in, uh, on Nicholas Street in the old city registry building. And it was opened in, on April 25th, 1917 by Mayor Harold Fisher as, quote, a museum for relics and souvenirs. So this finally allowed the Women's Canadian Historical Society to fulfill its original mandate to uh, collect and study and preserve Ottawa's history. Um, 
After years of collecting, especially uh, with the boom that came in the 1930s, the WCHSO was once again on the lookout for a much larger home to house its collection. And in 1948, the commissariat at the Ottawa Locks was proposed. Um, significant funds were raised to enact some of the urgent repairs of the dilapidated building at the time. And the HSO took possession of the building in 1951. Uh, it was described as encrusted with centuries old dust and grime with deteriorating plaster, a leaking roof and inadequate electrical system. Even so, the building committee report described the commissariat as the perfect setting for the Bytown Museum. Um, after much needed renovations, the museum opened in the commissariat on June 27th, 1952. And just some background on the local canvas uh, exhibition. So every year uh, we curate an in-house exhibition. It's uh, sometimes it marks a special anniversary as we had with our 100th anniversary in 2017 or our First World War exhibition marking at the start of the First World War in 2014. Um, sometimes we take a topic from our, our permanent gallery and kind of pull out what might be presented in simply one text panel and make it into a full fledged exhibition to really, you know, uh, dive deeper into a story like that. And then every so often we like to do something that's more like of a highlights exhibition. So picking up a particular aspect of our collection and uh, kind of just highlighting those, some of those key pieces within our collection, which is around 11,000 artifacts. Um, so uh, the, the kind of idea or the, focal, the, the, the focus of this exhibition being our paintings collection. Um, and the idea really came about in the last few years when we we're undertaking uh, the systemic, sy systematic digitization of our collection. And um, myself and a photographer started shooting our paintings collection and realizing how many, you know, just amazing pieces we have, uh, most of which are in storage. We have a handful of pieces on display at the museum and usually around 5% of a museum's um, collection is on display at any one time. So uh, again, in digitizing and photographing these, these paintings, we really discovered or rediscovered some of the great pieces and we wanted to share them. Um, the great thing about, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the great thing about that is that the museum, given that it's the oldest community collection in the city, um, we are able to, um, we, have, we have pieces that feature amateur and professional artists, but also local and national uh, artists. So um, we really get to kind of see a whole uh, gamut of, of, of paintings and, and skill levels and the way that they were looking at their city at the time. Um, and the, the, uh, the exhibition features portraiture, it features landscapes, it features um, buildings and scenery and events. So it's really kind of a good cross section um, features about 25 works uh, of which and we maybe have 300 paintings in our collection. So again, just a, a small handful, but uh, nonetheless uh, worth sharing with, with everyone. So uh, when we closed in March of 2020, um, us as in as everybody else, uh, we weren't quite sure, you know, what the future would hold with this. Would we be closed for, you know, a couple of weeks or a month or, or a year? Um, but our, our season generally starts in, in May, and so the decision was made to go ahead and install the exhibition. Uh, the thinking being if we opened as usual or a little bit late, at least the exhibit would be, would be ready for people to, to see and enjoy. And if things didn't uh, open, then at least we could incorporate it into our videos and our virtual tour. And so, as you know, uh, we, we didn't reopen in March of 2020 and we've yet to reopen. So it's been a very long period of time for us to, to be kind of away from our community and our visitors. But um, we're really thrilled to, to welcome everyone back. And uh, this exhibition will be on display for the full season until next spring. So uh, rest assured, there will be chances to see it. Okay, so before we move on to some of the highlights of the exhibit, I wanted to uh, show you a sneak preview of the virtual tour. And you'll have to bear with me because I think last time we had a bit of an issue technically with this. So just, I'm going to switch screens. 
And if you could let me know if you can see. Yes, we can, Grant. Okay, perfect, thank you. So um, this is our, our virtual tour module put on by our, our partners at Point3D Commercial Imaging. A uh, great company, two brothers founded it and started in the real estate industry and then um, decided to give back to the heritage community. And we were actually their first um, cultural partner. And so uh, you, if you've seen any kind of realtor walkthroughs, you'll notice some of the similarities, but um, it works really well for a museum of our size and of, of our resources. So when you, uh, when you come up to, to the entrance of the exhibition, you'll see kind of the intro uh, wall, which um, has, has the introductory text for, for the exhibition. Um, if you see the yellow uh, discs, if you hover over those, you can get some label text on pieces and you can also kind of blow up the, the pictures uh, to get a better view. Um, the red discs actually are video or audio content. Uh, in this case, um, it's myself <laughs> giving an introduction to the exhibition. Um, it was filmed as part of our Bytown Bit by Bit video guided tour series, which was one of our, our big projects during um, our closure during COVID. And so those videos can be seen. Some of them are embedded throughout the virtual tour. Others are they're on our website and our, our social media accounts. Um, so you can just hit play and, and watch through those. And also just of note, um, when I was preparing for the exhibition, and I always like to have a very different look and feel to the exhibition compared to our permanent galleries, which are a very, you know, muted tones. And um, we have a fragment of wallpaper in our, in our collection that was on in this hallway in the late 1800s. Um, and so I really, I tried to match that historic wallpaper as closely as I could with modern uh, patterns and uh, just to kind of harken back to that, to that time period. And I think the wallpaper really sets it up uh, nicely with the paintings. So there's, there's a bit of an explanation uh, there about that. But um, if you enter the space, you can get a sense of, of what it looks like. So if you've never been to the museum, it's kind of a long, a rectangular space um, heading down the hallway. I'll just give you like a, a quick look through. So um, each of these labels, you can get um, further further text on each piece as well as take a, a closer look at, um, at the image itself. The red discs again will give some audio or video content. Uh, this one just is me giving a spoken uh, explanation of the painting. And uh, you can kind of just, you know, make your way through the display. And um, so one thing we like to do every year in our temporary gallery is, um, is tell kind of individual stories. And so because the space, if you can see here, has, um, has two entrances, one at either end, and so we can't really control how people enter the space, is... Um, it doesn't really necessarily tell a chronological story. It's more individual stories. So when people are visiting the space, they can really, you know, see what catches their eye and uh, and pick out the individual stories that they want to they want to look at. And you know, we hope everyone kind of explores everything, but we know that's not always the case. And so we try and present it in a way that if you if you just pick, you know, half a dozen pieces that really catch your eye, you can still get uh, the gist of of the exhibition. And I'll just go down to the end of the hallway and give you a look from the other side. Okay, so uh, let's see if I can switch back here to my slideshow. And uh, because we had a bit of a technical issue with, in our walkthrough the other day, I, I had put some, uh, some uh, screenshots of the, of the virtual tour in here. So this is what you'll see when you start it. It's called the dollhouse view and you can actually, you know, pick any spot in the museum and click on it and kind of fly into the space. So we've recently updated it. We've got a lot of updates in the exhibition permanent galleries as well. And so you can visit the two floors of exhibits, the temporary gallery, 
as well as our vault uh, on the first floor. I'll just quickly go through these. And again, our part, our partners at uh, Point 3D have been, uh, we've been working with them for a number of years now. They've gone on to do great work with some of the national museums, a lot of the local museums, uh, and they are really passionate about helping uh, the cultural sector kind of build their online presence. So I can't really recommend, uh, recommend them enough. And they're great people to work with. Um, so now I'm gonna uh, move on to some highlights from the exhibition, a few of the pieces that I've decided to, to go into a bit more detail about. Okay, so um, I'm just going to move this here. Uh, the first piece is uh, an image of Wrightstown, and um, it was done by H. Wooding, but it's a, it's um, a copy of a of a piece done uh, originally in 1823 by Henry Duvernet. So um, this later watercolor depicts the bustling settlement of Wrightstown, later Hull founded by Philemon Wright and the pioneer families from Woburn, Massachusetts, uh, beginning in 1800. Um, during the early years of the lumber boom, started by, by Wright and his associates along the Ottawa River, and before the founding of Bytown, raftsmen would frequent Wright's tavern, bringing in much welcome uh, flow of hard currency with them. Depicted in this painting uh, from the viewers right to, or left to right, sorry, are the harness and shoemaker's shop, stables on the Columbia Falls farm, Wright's Tavern, which is the white uh, building with the cupola, grist and sawmill, boarding house, smithy, dry house, and lime kilns. Um, Wright's Tavern actually burnt down in 1808 and then again during the great fire of Ottawa Hall in 1900. And uh, I was actually speaking with Rick Henderson the other day. Um, I think Ben, you alluded to a project that he's working on as well as an upcoming talk of his um, where he's done uh, Google SketchUp uh, walkthrough walking tour of Wrightstown in 1830, which was fantastic. And uh, you guys should all really, really look forward to that uh, talk with Rick. But what we were really discussing was how the industry of Wrightstown, which provided, you know, lumber, beer, rations, flour, uh, cement uh, for the Rideau Canal project really was key. You know, it was established, you know, some nearly three decades before the Colonel Vi's arrival. And so you have to think about without the establishment of Wrightstown, um, would the canal have been built? It, they would have had to establish all their own industry prior or be shipping, you know, every single thing in from, from outside. And so it's just kind of a new interesting way of looking at the history of Ottawa from, from, the, from the opposite side of the river. And uh, so this is a print, uh, a lithograph from our collection by Stenton Laver Architects. It's City of Ottawa, Canada West, done in 1859. And you can see um, Barrack Hill, which is of course today's Parliament Hill. Uh, but the reason I'm showing this um, print is to show you kind of a view of Wrightstown at the time. So in the lower left, viewers lower left, uh, looking east towards um, Parliament Hill. And interestingly enough, when the Parliament was built, they, they reissued this lithograph with kind of an engraving of, of Parliament Hill kind of pasted on top and, and reprinted. So it's kind of early, early Photoshopping at its best. Um, and funnily enough, when we have a, a copy of this, this newer version in our collection and because it was done at two different times, uh, they kind of faded and discolored at different uh, rates. So it's really obvious that it's kind of just this addition slapped on top. Um, but again, the view of, of Wrightstown and the timber slide uh, bypassing the Chaudière Falls, um, looking east. And of course, the Rideau Canal is, is in the valley just, just past um, Barrack Hill. Um, so the next piece is actually, speaking of Colonel Bai, a silhouette of Lieutenant Colonel John Bai, done around 18, 1832. Uh, unfortunately, the artist is unknown. So, uh, John Bai presented this silhouette to one of his major contractors, Robert Drummond. Drummond was uh, most active around the Kingston Mills area of the canal works. And uh, Colonel Bai dedicated this to Drummond on the back in, in black ink. 
and gifted the silhouette to Drummond as well as the, the Drummond Cup trophy, which we have on our second floor exhibition. Uh, there's four such trophy cups given to the main contracting teams on the Rideau Canal and, and we have Drummond's. Uh, we did bring all four cups together uh, in 2017 for our 100th anniversary exhibition. It was quite a sight to see them all, all displayed in one place. Um, so uh, the silhouette is actually one of the only known contemporary likenesses of Bai. There are some paintings, there's the, uh, you know, the statue on Parliament Hill and the maquette of by Emil Brunette in our collection, um, which interestingly enough, Brunette used his son Eric as a model for, for Bai's face for that. Um, so the, this, um, the silhouette is really the only contemporary likeness we have of Bai. Uh, who was described both as corpulent and as the, the beau ideal of the British officer uh, by contemporary sources. Um, so Lieutenant Colonel Bai gave similar silhouette portraits to his three other main contracting teams because who doesn't want a picture of their boss as a gift, you know? <laughs> uh, job well done. I hope you remember me. So, um, Bai also had additional copies made of him, uh, his wife, and his two daughters, which he gifted to a handful of close friends uh, before his recall to England in 1832. And the museum actually holds two sets, two full sets of silhouettes of his of the Bai family. One was formerly in the pos possession of James Fitzgibbon. Uh, Fitzgibbon was Bai's master carpenter and at one time his clerk of works. Um, and actually, it was Fitzgibbon's niece, Ava Reed, who was a one-time curator of the Bytown Museum, uh, that through her, we were able to obtain a number of Bai's personal belongings. Um, when Bai was recalled to England, he left his, his possessions with James Fitzgibbon, assuming he would be back. Unfortunately, he died uh, in France in 1836, and so his possessions remained with Fitzgibbon and were passed, were passed down. Um, and we're lucky to have have those pieces in our collection to this day. And uh, the other copy was once owned by William Tormey, who was Bai's master blacksmith, and he operated a smithy uh, below today's Plaza Bridge. So this is just the um, inscription on the back. Mr. Drummond from Lieutenant Colonel Bai, Royal Engineers, Rideau Canal, January 1832. And all of the silhouettes that I've seen of the copies that we have um, are similarly inscribed by uh, Colonel Bai. And so um, on the viewer's left, you'll see the Drummond Cup trophy um, given to Robert Drummond along with the silhouette. It's actually inscribed with the date of the 21st of August, 1831, um, because they had to be made well in advance. And as we know, uh, all government projects like this are always late getting done. And so it's a little bit early uh, on the inscription, but um, this is one of the two smaller cups and there's also two larger trophy cups of a very similar design. On the right, there's um, one of the sets of silhouettes of Bai and his family. So you've got uh, John Bai and his wife, Esther, and then their daughters, Esther and Harriet. So one um, set of, of um, silhouettes is on display at the museum currently and another is, is in storage. Okay, so this piece um, is entitled Colonel Coffin's Residence. It was done by a local artist, Lily Stratton in the 1870s. And it depicts uh, our twin, long lost twin, our sister building, the Ordnance Office, also known as the Office of the Royal Engineers, which once stood opposite uh, the commissariat, today's Bytown Museum, on the east side of the Ottawa Locks. Um, you can still see uh, the outline of its foundation today. So this building served as the headquarters for the Rio Canal project from 1827 until 1832. And then by 1856, the ownership of the building had been transferred to the province of Canada West, um, Ontario. And then um, it served as the land, Ordnance Lands Office, as well as the private residence of Colonel William Foster Coffin, hence Colonel Coffin's residence. Um, in 1901, the Canadian Pacific Railway embankment uh, connecting uh, via the new Alexandra Interprovincial Bridge, uh, the embankment actually incorporated several meters of the Ordnance Office Eastern Wall and structure. And not only did this have a devastating effect on the stability of the building, but it also uh, had a really detrimental effect on the structure itself 
and uh, a decade of vibrations of heavy trains and streetcars passing over on a, you know, many times a day uh, caused major instability in the structure of the building and it was sadly demolished um, between 1911 and 1912. And uh, I often find myself, you know, looking forlornly over to the other side of the locks, wishing, wishing and wondering what we could do had that building survived. So this photo from our collection in, from the 1860s shows um, a great view of Entrance Bay uh, looking out to the Elbow River. You can see on the viewer's left the commissariat, so a Bytown Museum, and on the right uh, the Office of the Royal Engineers. You can also really see how, how industrial the lock site was and specifically the entrance uh, site because, you know, today we think of, of the locks as like this idyllic a retreat within you know the bustle of the city but it really was was not that for much of its of its history so it's it's kind of an interesting view to to see you know it wasn't very inviting uh to the average person certainly and this uh photo from our collection dated to around 1908 just gives you a real sense of the damage that that embankment did so if you take a look at the roof line like the roof line was literally cut away uh, to make way for this embankment. And, um, you know, it wasn't just behind it, it was actually in the building. And to the point where if you look at that embankment today, you can see where ceiling joists and, and floor beams uh, were once incorporated into that wall. So um, clearly heritage conservation standards were not a thing um, 110 years ago. And so it's unfortunate that we've lost that building, but we have photos, we have paintings like Lily Stratton's and drawings and, and other uh, pieces to, to remind us of it, as well as the foundation, which, which still exists today. So uh, this watercolor, it's actually quite a tiny piece, was done by a P. Checkley of the mills of New Edinburgh around uh, Rideau Falls. And um, upon the completion of the Rideau Canal in 1832, Thomas McKay, who was Lieutenant Colonel's head masonry contractor on the Ottawa Locks, actually encouraged his many of his workers to settle on his thousand acre estate uh, east of Rideau Falls, which was he dubbed New Edinburgh in honor of his Scottish heritage. Um, the new neighborhood was laid out into lots starting in 1834 and included a, a large residence for McKay, which would eventually become uh, today's Rideau Hall, the, the residence of the Governor General. But uh, Mackay was a very enterprising man and was only responsible for construction of the Ottawa Locks and the, some of the buildings surrounding, but also Earnscliff, uh, the courthouse, the jail, and of course, Rideau Hall. Um, he began by building saw and grist mills in the 1830s, flour and cloth mills in the 1848, and additional sawmills on Green Island, which is um, Green Island is where the former city hall of the 1950s is located. Um, and this was all done in partnership with his son-in-law, John McKinnon, operating under the name of Mackay and McKinnon until 1852. After passing through various hands and undergoing many changes, the entire milling complex was destroyed by fire in July of 1907. And this is kind of a different view of, of the, same, uh, the same place. So this is from William Hunter Jr.'s um, Ottawa scenery. This is uh, Rideau Falls falling into the Ottawa River from 1855. So just, you know, a stark contrast to the much more industrial uh, view that we just, we just looked at. So now uh, one of the first portraits uh, of which there's, there's quite a number of portraits in, in the, the um, exhibition I find that uh, you know you can look at artifacts and scenery all you want but until you kind of see a face and, and read a name it really you know it re you really see those real historical connections and you can kind of get a sense that this was a person that existed it wasn't just you know a, a days gone by or or a changes in, in buildings and structures so um, this painting is of Captain Henry Allen Bate. It was done around the turn of the century. Uh, Bate was born May 12, 1856 in a very well-to-do Ottawa family. The family originated in Truro, Cornwall in, in England. And uh, Henry was the son of Henry Newell Bate 
and Lady Catherine Bate, born Catherine Cameron. Um, Henry was the commanding officer of the Governor General's foot guards for a time, and he also acted in the role of the Consul General of Belgium. Uh, this portrait was done by uh, W.A. Sherwood and depicts Bate wearing the uniform worn while he was attaché to Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier. So while it's not uh, dated on, on the canvas, we do know it's within the time frame of, of Laurier's uh, time as Prime Minister. So the decorations you see adorning his uniform were actually given uh, via, uh, through Her Majesty Queen Victoria through the Prince of Wales at Buckingham Palace uh, during the Jubilee year of 1897. Sadly, uh, Bate died of pneumonia in Manhattan on May 1st of 1910. And so the museum actually has uh, portraits of both his father and his mother, um, Henry Newell Bate and Lady Catherine Bate. Uh, the, the, the family was big in, in the grocery and retail stores, but also uh, very big in real estate, specifically in Sandy Hill. And Bate was actually the first president of the Ottawa Improvement Commission, which was the forerunner to the National Capital Commission. So uh, the portrait of, of Henry, you can see in our third floor permanent galleries, while the portrait of Lady Catherine we actually have also um, on display in the temporary gallery. So um, this work is uh, simply entitled The Inside of a Log Cabin. We wanted to really make sure that uh, the paintings that we selected showed both the beauty of Ottawa, the industry of Ottawa, uh, the everyday people of Ottawa, the elite of Ottawa, uh, portraits, sceneries. So this is one that we chose um, to give you kind of a view of the typical uh, first permanent dwellings of Bytown. So these uh, original log cabins were constructed with kind of one large room on the ground floor where cooking and gathering took place, as well as often it was shared with some, some livestock. Um, and then uh, there would have been a small loft above for storage and sleeping. So this uh, piece was actually painted by a Scottish born artist named Patty Jack. Um, you can see the, the ever boiling pot over the, the central hearth. And Jack was actually visiting um, her sister in 1900 when, in Ottawa when she, when she painted this piece. And um, just to give you kind of a little bit of, of background again on some of the work required to kind of bring these exhibitions to life. This is, this is the same painting um, before treatment and after treatment. Um, we really want, we really think it's important to show a painting as the artist intended it to be seen. And so uh, we work really closely with a, an amazing company, Legree Conservation Inc. And they're a family-run business, family-run uh, group of conservators. They work with the National Gallery, they work with Parliament Hill, and I've worked with them personally for my entire time at Bytown. And they just do fantastic work. And something as simple for this painting as, as removing old uh, varnish and just um, revealing you know, the original colors below, you can really see what the original piece looked like and even from the light streaming in the window and stuff. Although I have to say um, the left, the original kind of evokes that smoky interior that you, you would expect to, to see and smell in, in a place like a small log cabin, but um, certainly certainly the, the restored version is, is uh, what the artist's intention was. And, and so this piece is actually another one by, by Patty Jack. So um, again, she was visiting her sister, Miss E. Prince, when the Great Fire of Hull broke out on April 26, 1900. Um, and she was able to actually document before, during, and after the fire. The fire actually began as a small chimney fire in Hull and quickly jumped from house to house due to strong winds. By noon, it was an uncontrollable blaze. Winds fanned the flames and blew burning shingles towards the lumber piles of E.B. Eddy and the Hull Lumber Company. And by 1 p.m., the, the flames actually crossed the bridge into the Ottawa side and started to consume the tinder dry lumber piles of J.R. Booth and H.F. Bronson. The fire was fought in earnest for many hours, but finally burnt itself out around midnight, uh, but not before destroying two thirds of Hull, 
leaving approximately 40% of its population homeless. 15% uh, of Ottawans at the Breton Flats also lost their homes. So uh, Jack was able to document the devastation of the fire in a series of five paintings. Uh, this is just one of them and we have um, two as part of the exhibition. And um, she captured the views uh, from several vantage points, including the corner of Sparks and Concession, which is Bronson Avenue, um, looking down uh, onto the flats. And this is a photo from our collection. Um, it was taken by Dr. Henry Mark Ami of the Geological Survey of Canada. Um, we have two photo albums of Ami's in our collection, each containing several hundred photos um, of his travels and his work in Ottawa, excavating Strathcona Park um, and the like. But actually one of the albums contains about a dozen uh, contemporary photos of the Great Fire. So uh, this image um, is the view of Duke Street looking northwest over the flats. And um, as you can see, Pooley's pumping station in the lower left, as well as um, kind of, you can see people fleeing, fleeing the fire in the right with, with their meager possessions. And I have seen photos of kind of a more street view of this and people are just carrying whatever they can in their, in their hands to, to get away from it. Okay, so this, this work is uh, this beautiful view of the Rideau Canal near the Bank Street Bridge, um, close to today's Lansdowne Park. It was done by Lucinda Hodgins around 1914. Um, when Sir Wilfrid Laurier was elected Prime Minister in 1896, Ottawa was a town of lumber and industry without piped water or paved streets. In 1899, Lor the Laurier government sought to beautify the capital. If Ottawa was gonna be the capital of Canada, he said, it should look like it. And he was quoted as wanting to have the quote, Ottawa of the, or the, the Washington of the North rather. So with that, um, the Ottawa Improvement Commission was founded in 1899, which is the forerunner of the National Capital Commission and began to formally, uh, formally begin the efforts to beautify um, downtown Ottawa. So a few short years later, Artist Lucinda Hodgins sat under the Bank Street Bridge and painted this beautiful scene that surrounded her. The manicured walkway and the well-groomed fall trees were all examples of the Improvement Commission's efforts to beautify uh, the capital. And it's also part of, of Laurier's enduring legacy. So you compare this with the really industrial view of the Ottawa Locks um, a, a few slides back to, to kind of what we see now. And you can see just, you know, 15 years after uh, the founding of the OIC, their efforts to kind of really give people um, green space within, within Ottawa. So this photo uh, is on the Queen Elizabeth driveway along the canal near Bank Street. It's actually um, from Library and Archives Canada and it's from 1916, so just two years after uh, Hodgins painting. So this piece is entitled A Brag Load uh, by uh, a local amateur artist, L. Babin. So uh, it's a brag load known as a brag load of yellow pine. And the pine was felled on the lumber limits of the Gillies Brothers Lumber Company who were operating in McNabb Brayside Township. Um, I've seen photos, I've seen paintings, I've seen drawings of these, of these loads. Uh, and you always get questions about, there's no way horses could pull that those two horses would never move that. And, and as far as I've, uh, my research has, has led me to believe, uh, the largest of these loads were actually created for the spectacle um, and were partially dismantled before being, before being moved. Um, a lumberman's job was incredibly dangerous uh, on the everyday and it's hard to believe that they would create something uh, such as this, which must have been incredibly dangerous to do uh, for show, but uh, the bravado of, of the lumbermen uh, prevailed, I suppose. Um, so it was often actually done on Sundays as competition between uh, neighboring lumber camps to see who could create the biggest brag load. Um, so one of the men on the top is said to be longtime um, Gilly Brothers foreman Cecil Joseph Charbet, and it was actually he who donated the painting to the museum 
uh, in 1976. The Gilly Brothers and Company uh, were sold in 1963, and that ended 90 years of family ownership. All I can think of is poor horses. And uh, just to give a sense of you know how massive uh, the lumber industry was in Ottawa and the Ottawa Valley, um, this is a log jam from from up uh, in the valley. And um, I remember re reading. In 1890, uh, the industry felled 4 million trees and, and employed 20,000 workers uh, just in the valley area. So just a massive, massive industry um, that dominated Ottawa for, for many decades. And so uh, the last piece I'm highlighting is entitled simply Bytown 1840. It was done uh, by Manchester-born artist Joseph Sidney Hallam in 1946. Um, so it was commissioned actually by O'Keeffe's Brewery for their offices and is actually based on another of William Hunter Jr.'s engraving uh, called View from Barrack Hill, Ottawa River, Canada, 1855. Um, Hallam worked with group of seven member, Franklin Carmichael. He taught at the Ontario College of Art and was a founding member of the Royal Canadian Academy. Uh, this view was very much lost to the time of the artist, uh, having you know an, a further century of industrial buildup surrounding the flats, uh, mostly as regards the lumber industry. But it depicts a scene looking west from Barrack Hill, today's Parliament Hill, uh, towards the Shodier Falls. In 1855, William S. Hunter Jr. wrote the illustrated and illustrated. Hunter's Ottawa Scenery in the vicinity of Ottawa City, Canada. It was a, an ambitious book comprised of 15 scenic engravings, a preface, a map of Eastern North America, and four informative chapters about Ottawa. Uh, this was published in the same year that Bytown was rebranded as Ottawa and was seen as almost, um, almost like a tourism booklet, if you will, to bring, to bring people, to bring industry to the new capital, to really get people um, interested in and excited about Ottawa, at the time, uh, a town of 10,000 people. So again, a very stark contrast between what Hallam was painting uh, in 1840 versus what he would actually have been seeing in 1946. And um, this is Hunter's um, original view from 1855. I'll just go back to the painting for a second. If you Take a look in the lower left corner. You can see there's two people, one sitting, one standing, and the spindly trees above them. Um, and while some details differ slightly, I mean, Hunter's view has, has the same people in the same place, the same spindly trees. Um, so it was really a case of, uh, of kind of, of uh, you know, copying an earlier view to harken back to that, to that time. So that's kind of the the highlights that I've I've picked out from the exhibition. And um, before I end my talk, I just wanted to give people some news, some upcoming events and programs, and kind of what's happening with the museum since we have been closed for uh, over two years now. So um, as you know, and I, I'm sure she's here right now, uh, Robin Etherington, our longtime director, has uh, has retired. Uh, very deservedly so, even though I know she won't be very far away. And so we're very, very uh, excited to welcome our new executive director, Courtney Galing, to the museum, who started a couple of months ago. Um, but we're also in the process of replacing two of our, our managers. So we have a very small staff, including only four full-time permanent managers. So uh, in replacing two, you know, it's a big, a big uh, portion of our staff. And so part of our planning behind um, our reopening plan is really just having the staff in place and trained and ready to go before, before we start welcoming people back. So um, we've also got our, our new summer team in place. We have five great students who are, who are being trained on tours and programs and the operation of the museum uh, these last few weeks. And actually our first kind of foray into public programs, although we have had a few uh, private tours, 
is uh, on Saturday, June 4th for part of Doors Open Ottawa. We're having free hourly uh, outdoor lock talk tours. So the building and facility will still remain closed for now, but uh, those tours are available. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're either close to being sold out or already sold out. So uh, we'll we're gonna have to see if we are able to accommodate more people or offer more tours. But again, given our, our current staffing, uh, we're, we're kind of doing, doing what we can to, to get people interested in what the museum is doing again in person. Um, in June, we'll continue to offer pre-book tours and programs. We're hoping to have some school groups potentially and our, our CLIC program with, with uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage. And then we're really looking forward to fully reopening um, starting in July when we have our full complement of staff up and trained. And of course, you know, we've been doing amazing online and virtual programming for the last two years, but really nothing uh, compares to, you know, welcoming our community back into the museum and into the oldest building in their city. And so we really, really, really looking forward to, to welcoming people back in person. Um, but in the meantime, we have our virtual tour. We have our Bytown bit by bit series and art of feature videos. I actually just posted the last of our art of feature videos, which was a run of 43 um, videos. But we're kind of gonna start switching gears and focusing more of, of what we're gonna be doing to welcome people in. Um, and maybe revisit those types of series uh, again in the fall when when things when the season slows down a bit. Uh, as as always, our social media is available on our website, but also we have downloadable crafts, downloadable scavenger hunts, um, a lot of children's activities. You can explore our online database through uh, the city's um, collections portal, and on our website you can find our archived uh, entertainment videos and our light, our by town lecture series. Um, so. Please continue to check back on our website and social media for, for news on uh, available programs and, and tours and uh, news about our, our final uh, reopening. But we will be reopening this summer uh, when we have the staff uh, up and ready and the time is right. So we're very, very much looking forward to, to welcoming you all back in person. So I'd just like to take a minute to thank the Historical Society uh, for inviting me to do this talk. I think it's been a great opportunity to share uh, what we've been working on, but also what people can expect when they can finally come back into the museum. And um, yeah, just a fantastic opportunity. And I hope the next time I give a talk that uh, I can see, see you all face to face, but uh, nonetheless, it was, it was just a great to, uh, to share with you. So thank you very much. And, um, I guess I'll pass it back to uh, Richard for questions. Actually, I'll, I'll take care of the questions, uh, Grant. And oh, first of all, I want to say thank you for, for a wonderful presentation. I mean, all of us enjoy the stories of Otto's history, but you've taken a selection of paintings and basically played a little bit of hopscotch through our history and told our history from such interesting perspectives. Um, we all, we all, we're all visual people, right? And basically that's what you've done with the paintings tonight, so I want to thank you. So in terms of questions, um, can you give us a bit more clarification on the Drummond Cup trophy? And what was that for? Sure, so uh, Colonel By's main uh, contracting teams um, at the end of the construction of the canal were given uh, these silver trophy cups. So Robert Drummond, uh, who worked mostly at Kingston Mills was given um, what we call the Drummond Cup. It's actually, there's two smaller cups. And while they're these kind of magnificent uh, pieces, um, it was really used as an opportunity to, uh, to put the contractors in their place in terms of hierarchy. So you had uh, Mackay and Redpath who had one large cup. You had Drummond who had uh, one small cup to himself. And then you had the contracting team of, of Phillips and White who, who shared one cup. Uh, I don't know how you share such a thing. Maybe one person takes the lid home and then they, they swap after a few years. But um, so yeah, the Drummond Cup is the one that we have. There's, uh, there is uh, one at the Redpath Museum, John Redpath's. Um, and then there is one at uh, Rideau Hall and then one at the Chateau Ramsey in Montreal. So in um, 2017, we brought them all together 
on display as part of our our hundredth anniversary exhibition, and um, it was just fantastic to see them all in one place. I don't think that had happened for probably fifty years. Um, I just want to confirm that we do have confirmation that the uh, the doors open event is sold out at this point, uh, given the, the the current structure that you have set up for it. And I also want to mention that we have posted. Uh, the link to your virtual tour on the chat boards if anybody's interested in taking a look at that again. So I have a question here. Uh, what kind of environmental measures are needed to preserve the museum's paintings and artifacts? So uh, our collection, for those of you who, who don't know, is actually stored um, in the Diefenbunker uh, out in Carp. And so um, they, they have actually gone through major, major upgrades over the last number of years in terms of their um, HVAC system, as well as uh, their fire suppression systems, their internet, everything, lots of, lots of major upgrades. Um, but actually, it's quite a stable environment. It may not be, you know, National Gallery level ideal, but um, for a museum of our size to have a stable, safe environment um, is key. And, um, and so the pieces are, are stored um, in the Diefenbunker. And uh, Rob, one of Robin's favorite um, jokes was that if there was ever a nuclear war, at least the collection would survive. So we can <laughs> take some, some sick solace <laughs> uh, in that. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the Bytown Museum, when pieces are on display, so uh, it's the oldest building in Ottawa. There is no kind of modern um, building envelope where we can control um, everything to, to a T, but we do have a modern uh, ventilation and air conditioning system. Um, it gets it gets rather dry um, in the winter months, but uh, generally we, we keep the temperature at a very very constant level. And uh, the humidity, while it does swing somewhat, it's very gradual. And um, and uh, we monitor it. We have uh, live monitors and then monthly tracking of of uh, the the conditions. But then also. Um, light levels are always checked, so we're concerned about kind of the total exposure of light on certain things, uh, pieces that are metal or stone, you know, can injure a lot of light damage, whereas like a, a, a charcoal drawing, very little, so everything's treated um, accordingly. And for the paintings exhibition, you know, we installed it back in April of 2020, and uh, when we started going back to work physically at the museum part-time, um, I actually turned the lights off specifically in that room so that when people were working at the museum, there was even less exposure because I knew I wanted this exhibition to stay up uh, for a full season once we reopened and I didn't know when that would be. And so um, I wanted to really keep that, that light exposure down given that uh, it, was, it was kind of just sitting and uh, waiting for people. So um, yeah, we don't have, we certainly don't have the controls that uh, some of the national museums would have, but uh, it, it does the job. Somebody noted, uh, you know, showing you the virtual tour of the exhibit, uh, definitely did look like a real estate video. It looks like a, a beautiful, somebody's beautiful home. Yet you started by talking about how it was, how did you describe the, uh, the museum? How did they describe the museum when they, when they first started taking a look at it in 1948 as uh, decrepit, was it? Oh yes, uh, let me just get my notes for the for the actual. Um, so it was encrusted with centuries old dust and grime, deteriorating plaster, a leaking roof, and an, an inadequate electrical system. But uh, they still described it as the perfect setting for the Bytown Museum. So the question is, how how um, what are the challenges of of maintaining a modern museum and Ottawa's oldest stone building? Oh, uh, there are many. <laughs> Um, I mean, some of the challenges are simply, you know, the footprint is very finite. It's, you know, there's only a certain amount of space. Um, not that we would want to expand it or, or add additions or anything, um, but um, there is a certain finite amount of space to, to work with, as well as uh, given the heritage status of the building, um, we wouldn't be undertaking any major irreversible changes or, you know, drilling into the stonework or anything of that nature. Um, all of the exhibition spaces that we present in have had um, drywall put up in the 1980s. And so when we're hanging pieces for display, 
they're being mounted on on contemporary structures uh, that are are otherwise you know unaffecting the building itself. Um, part of it is too that you know the muse the building is the in a sense the largest artifact. So we present the history of the city and we present the artifacts in our collection, but we're also presenting you know the history via the building and the locks, which is is right next door. And so I think. Um, the pros far outweigh the cons. I mean, we couldn't we couldn't tell the story that we tell in any other location. It's it's just too perfect. And so we we've learned to to work within the space. We have great partnerships with with Parks Canada, with the NCC, um, with the Parliamentary Precinct, and um, you know it's it's typical Ottawa. There's jurisdictional issues, but um, but uh, we've got lots of of good people on the ground, and, and we've made that work for us over over many years. So. Um, yeah, uh, working in any historic heritage building is going to have is going to have um, implications. But um, again, I think it far outweighs the pros, far outweigh the cons. I've got a couple of related questions. Uh, one is, what percentage of the collection is on display at any given time? And the other question is, do you have any agreement with Library and Archives Canada for storage? Uh, so there's roughly five percent of the exhibition on display at any one time. Uh, that's pretty standard across most museums. Um, if, if you look at even the larger museums, like say the Canadian Museum of History, yes, they have a much, much, much bigger space, but they also have millions of pieces. Um, our collection has around 11,000 artifacts, so it's all it's all relative. So um, annually, you know, we do the temporary exhibition where we bring out new pieces for for people to see. Every year I'm always um, doing updates to the permanent galleries. So while kind of the chronological narrative um, arc doesn't change, there's always new stories, new pieces, and that allows for rotation um, from a conservation standpoint, but also um, just uh, getting new pieces out for people to see. Um, we've, we've tried to do our best in terms of uh, online content through social media through our our database and stuff and that kind of thing but uh you know seeing a piece in person is always is always the key um and sorry the question about library and archives was that do we have an agreement to store items with library and archives yeah uh no we don't um over the years i've explored a few options um when Science and Technology Museum was undergoing a massive uh, remodel, there were some talks that I started about uh, having space in their storage uh, for our collection, but in the end they had to actually reduce their their own building and so uh, there was less space available. Um, and I have explored some options, um, but really it's a massive, massive capital project to, to uh, move a, a collection. Every piece needs to be cataloged and recataloged, wrapped, packed, moved, unpacked. Um, so the last couple of years I have started seriously looking at, at viable options, um, but at this time uh, there's no concrete plans to, uh, to partner up and move. What about the other way, uh, 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 an um, agreement to perhaps display items from Library and Archives Canada? Um, well, we don't have like an ongoing agreement with any one museum, but we do have uh, short and long-term loans on a fairly regular basis. We've had loans from Library and Archives and the Canadian Museum of History, uh, the National Gallery, the City of Ottawa Museums, um, as well as going back and forth the other way. So uh, because our collection is, is uh, you know, it's Ottawa-centric, but because of its, its age, we have quite a few pieces that are of national significance. So we have pieces on loan uh, to the Museum of History and the Canada's History Hall, uh, again, we've loaned to um, the National Gallery of Canada. We have loans, um, we had loans at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights and at Pier 21 in Halifax, and also um, uh, over in Ireland in Darcy McGee's hometown of Carlingford. So, um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that our, our efforts to digitize the collection and have our online database um, allows other museums to, to know and see what we have. Um, so we've had lots of requests for loans from, you know, our local partners because we can now see what each other has so we can fill, fill gaps in our, in our displays. Um, and also for collecting purposes, um, if we're offered um, an item which may not fit in our collection, we can certainly um, contact our, our partners. 
So uh, we're fairly active um, both in incoming and outgoing loans, but we don't have any, you know, regular uh, agreement per se. What about the NCC? They have artifacts apparently from Colonel By's home and from Philemon Wright's home. Uh, any opportunity to work with the NCC to uh, showcase those in a better way than the NCC could? Yeah, we, we have had talks in the past um, about the potential of displaying some of those items um, in say a temporary exhibition or something like that. Um, given our small staff and our, our limited resources, we do plan many years in advance. I actually have a five year temporary exhibition policy or uh, uh, plan. So uh, five years out, we have, we have plans in the works for temporary exhibitions. Our community gallery is booked up several years in advance with our with community partners who want to use the space. So there is an option to kind of have a small display there or incorporate some pieces in our exhibition, but uh, kind of beyond our walls, we have no additional display space. We certainly don't have any additional storage space. So um, we'd love to, to, to work together with the NCC on items like that for, for certain, but uh, it's one of those one of those restrictions of, of the, the space that we occupy. And it was the same when we went up to Parliament Hill and saw some of the pieces coming out of the archaeological digs up there. I mean, I would have, I would have loved to, uh, to scoop up a few of those pieces for our collection. But um, uh, the, the thing is with us and with our, our small, um, our limited storage space and our small exhibition space, it's a great thing for us to have these strong partnerships with other museums where we could obtain pieces on loan uh, for exhibitions. So that's one way for us to kind of to, to work ahead and with our partner. <clears throat> what items, paintings or exhibits are most popular among visitors and what are your personal favorites? Um, people ask me that all the time and I guess I like to say that's like choosing your favorite child, but I only have one child, so it doesn't really translate for me. Um, my favorite pieces actually uh, in the collection deal with kind of, you know, just the everyday people uh, of Bytown. Um, we've got some really interesting kind of farm implements. Um, actually, one of the pieces that I actually like the most is, is a loy, a loy spade, which is used for cutting peat. Peat would have been used um, to heat homes in the early days. Just like a very simple tool, very rudimentary tool that really tells a very powerful story of, of the people of, of Bytown. And um, I also am really uh, passionate about uh, the history of, of Bytown during uh, the, rough, the rough days of the, of the Shiners Wars um, in which Bytown was essentially ruled by by uh, roving street gangs, um, very, very far from today's kind of sleepy government town reputation of Ottawa. So I love telling people those stories because if they think of Ottawa, especially if they're a tourist and they come from uh, even another country and they think of Ottawa as the seat of, of national government, they certainly don't think of, of people's homes being blown up with kegs of black powder. Um, so I love those stories. And in terms of visitors, I mean, one of our biggest uh, pieces that people love um, to see is uh, the death hand of Thomas Darcy McGee. Um, it's popular with visitors, it's popular with uh, media, it's popular with uh, the haunted walk. Um, so it's, it's always a draw. And um, again, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but we actually have a copy over in uh, Carlingford in McGee's hometown um, where they have a heritage center there. So, and it's a very different view of McGee, of course. Um, here he's seen as one of the, you know, fathers of confederation, whereas in Carlingford, he's very much seen as a, a traitor um, to uh, Irish Republicans So, So um, yeah, I think probably the McGee death hand is one of the biggest draws. You gave us a great presentation. It's hard to believe it's three years ago you gave us a presentation on Irish history in Bytown. And that was one of the last presentations we did at the Roche Center, which as you know, the HSO, we had our speaker series there for decades. And, and I, I remember how many people showed up for Pete's sake, Irish history in March. We, we, this is a small classroom that we had our meetings in. I can remember yeah. 
big borrowing and stealing chairs from all over the building. And I'm sure if the fire department had come in, they would have shut us down. But we must have had 50 or 60 people jammed into that room, Grant, and really, really reinforced our decision that following September to move to the auditorium for our presentation series because uh, we just want to be able to invite the world to enjoy these great, uh, great uh, speaker series. And yes, next spring we'll, we'll try to have you in the auditorium so people can actually see you. They've been seeing you virtually for two years. Um, they're, they're wondering if your pants collection is going to be going to museum at some point with all your plaids and your reds. Um, and I have one, and nothing else, I have one more question myself. Sure. And that is, what is the secret recipe for the lemonade that you guys serve every summer? Is that a top secret or can you reveal that? Well, it wouldn't quite be a secret if I told you. <laughs> it, it, it's it's in the archive along with our secret lumberjack uh, waffle recipe. So you can you can enjoy it, but uh, you can't make it at home. Okay. If anybody else has any questions, I'll invite you at this point. You can unmute yourself if you have any last questions or comments for Grant. This was our final speaker series presentation of the season, and you made it a great one. Uh, it will be oh, available in so recorded much. form uh, coming up pretty soon. And um, we look forward to September. I see Rick is with us tonight. Rick will be one of our speakers in September. And uh, we'll be hoping to do twin virtual and live in the auditorium talks if all goes well. In the meantime, check out our website, follow us on Facebook. Um, we continue through the summer. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again. Have a good evening. Thanks, Grant. That was great. Thank you. Take care.